Hi, I'm Reverend Jim Sanders. I'm the pastor here at First United Methodist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We're in the high foothills of the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. Welcome to worship for Sunday, August 16th, 2020, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. We continue to post both our 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship services on our church Facebook page and on our church YouTube page so you can join us for worship as uh, your schedule uh, permits, but also so that you can share these services with your family and your friends as the Lord leads. We hope you will do that. We are also now gathering on Sunday mornings at 8.45 a.m. and at 11 a.m., our traditional in-person worship times. We're gathering on Zoom then uh, to share greetings among congregation households, share news with one another, and also uh, to uh, experience our worship services uh, as a, a community. In between Sundays, our public Facebook page, our private church Facebook group, our both great ways to stay connected. There are also uh, Facebook uh, groups for children and for youth. We hope you will uh, get connected with the ones that are appropriate for, for you. I, I wanna say thank you to our phone tribe leaders and to our Holy Rollers for doing such a wonderful job of keeping us connected, of bridging the gaps between us uh, while we are apart from one another. If there's something that your church can do for you, I hope you will let your phone tribe leader know, uh, let Shannon know, or reach out to me. We'll respond in uh, whatever uh, way we uh, can. Our beautiful building, it remains closed, and so we are encouraging our Sunday school classes and other groups in our church family to meet together formally or informally uh, on Zoom instead of in person. R remember, you do not have to have a video link to participate in a Zoom gathering. You can call in from any um, telephone. So if you would like to schedule a Zoom gathering, uh, let Shannon know and she can set that up um, for you. Our middle high and senior high UMYF groups uh, are meeting on uh, Sunday evenings in the uh, back parking lot and uh, they're doing mission-related activities, and they're going to continue to do that as long as it seems safe. Masks are required, and there is no access to our uh, building. Middle schoolers are meeting from 5 to 6 p.m. High schoolers are meeting from 6 to 7 p.m. We've been at it for a couple of weeks now, and we've already had guests. And so uh, I hope uh, for uh, middle school. Uh, middle school and high school students that you will participate in our UMIF and that you'll even consider uh, bringing your friends. I've been seeing pictures now for the last few days of uh, friends on Facebook posting pictures uh, of uh, the experience of dropping their kids off at college at the colleges and universities that are gathering students uh, uh, for uh, in-person uh, study and uh, living here at the church. Uh, we want to make sure that we have up-to-date contact information uh, for all our college students. And so if you are one or if you have one in your uh, household, uh, please make sure that Laura has their current uh, information. Over the past two weeks, volunteers from our church family have given their time uh, to operate the school system's meal distribution site at Millers Creek Elementary School. Uh, we did that so that the food service employees who had been at it all summer could have a few days off and get some uh, training for this upcoming uh, school year. Also this past Wednesday uh, morning, our outreach ministry team using funds made available through your generous giving provided breakfast for the faculty and the staff at North Wilkesboro Elementary School.
Dennis Huggins. We're here at Miller's Creek Elementary. We're packing lunches for school students to come by here. We've been doing this for, this is our second week, and uh, the kids get two breakfasts and two lunches each day, and thanks to all the volunteers that have helped. Let's prepare ourselves for worship. Wherever you find yourself, no matter how many distractions compete for your attention, it is my prayer that you will enter into an attitude of worship. Feel the floor beneath your feet. Fill your lungs with the air of a new day. Seek a renewed awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit who binds us together. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. This week we have received prayer requests for Bryant and Bobby Church, who are the uncle and the aunt of Ken Church. Let's also be in prayer for school administrators and for teachers and for staff and students and their families and their caregivers during this stressful and ever-changing back-to-school season. If you have a prayer request you'd like us to pray along with you, then let Shannon know by the end of Tuesday. God hears all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, so I invite you to turn with me to God in prayer. Father in heaven, mothering God, creator of us all, creator of all that we can see and all that we don't even know about, we come to you confessing that we have done little to make this world a better place that we have not shouldered the burdens of others, that we have chosen the easier path rather than the one that would take us through troubled territory. Forgive us, God, for disobeying you and draw closer to us now as we seek to be made more like you, more loving, more creative, more hope-filled, more joyous, more capable, more of a community where all are welcome, where all are nurtured, where all are able to live freely and without fear. Realign our allegiances, God. Tamp down the seductive voices which threaten to distract us. Quiet the hate which does damage to the hearts of leaders and followers alike. And wherever hate or fear lives in our hearts, God, send your angels to perform radical surgery 
so that whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever choices we make, especially in those moments when we are tired or pushed or rushed or in a panic, God, send your angels to perform radical surgery on our hearts and our minds so that even at our worst moments, we might still be instruments of love and joy and peace and understanding. Hear the prayers of our hearts, our prayers for Bryant and Bobby Church. Wherever there is sickness in the world, God, we beg you to heal it. Wherever hearts are broken, we beg you to knit them back together. And wherever hopelessness reigns, we beg you to let the sun shine. And not just in far-fung places on the other side of the world, but in the streets and on the roads of North Wilkesboro and Miller's Creek and Adley and Boomer and Fair Plains and Moravian Falls and everywhere around and in between. Here at the beginning of a new school year, O God of wisdom, we offer special thanks and praise for the gift of new beginnings and for the opportunity to learn and to wonder We pray for administrators, for teachers and staff and students and families and caregivers that this year might be rewarding for all. Be with everyone who faces the challenge of new tasks, the fear of failure, the expectations of parents and friends and self. And as for us, God, in our learning and in our teaching, may we grow in service to others and in love for your world. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
want to thank everyone who has been faithful to find a way to send in your tithes and your offerings in this time when our church family is not meeting together for worship. The work of this congregation and of our United Methodist connection, it goes on regardless of whether or not we're in or out of our church buildings. You can, as many of you are doing, mail your offerings to our church post office box. That's P.O. Box 1145, P.O. Box 1145, North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, 28659. You can do essentially the same thing by using your bank's bill pay system. Or you can use the giving portal on our church website at www.firstnw.org. Whichever method you choose, thank you. And now I would like to offer a prayer over this offering plate as a way of giving thanks for all the gifts of our church family. Gifts not just of, of money, but also of time and talents and, and prayers. So for all the gifts... Let's pray. God of love and mercy, we give you thanks that the compassion of Christ was challenged to move beyond the people of one community. May it be a reminder to us, his disciples, to follow this example in our living and in our giving. Bless all the gifts of this church family. Help them empower us to see and move beyond our walls, beyond our communities, and across the divides of nation and race and creed, and to be generous as we share our blessings that all have their source in you, God of us all. We pray this in the name of our rock and our redeemer, Christ the Lord. Amen. This is our first reading for the morning. It is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, verses 1 and verses 6 through 8. The Lord says, Act justly and do what is righteous, because my salvation is coming soon, and my righteousness will be revealed. Happy is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not making it impure and avoids doing any evil. The immigrants who have joined me, serving me and loving my name, becoming my servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath without making it impure, and those who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and bring them joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their entirely burned offerings and sacrifices on my altar. My house will be known as a house of prayer for all peoples. Says the Lord God who gathers Israel's outcast will gather still others to those I have already gathered. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson, our gospel lesson, comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Hear the gospel. Hear the good news. Jesus called the crowd near and said to them, Listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that contaminates a person in God's sight. 
It's what comes out of the mouth that contaminates the person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be pulled up. Leave the Pharisees alone. They are blind people who are guides to blind people. But if a blind person leads another blind person, they were both, will both fall into a ditch. Then Peter spoke up, explain this riddle to us. And Jesus said, don't you understand yet? Don't you know that everything that comes, that goes into the mouth, enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what goes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And that's what contaminates a person in God's sight. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual sins, thefts, false testimonies, and insults. These contaminate a person in God's sight. But eating without washing hands doesn't contaminate in God's sight. From there, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But he didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, Send her away. She keeps shouting after us. And Jesus replied, I've been sent only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He replied, It's not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. And Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. May God bless our reading, our hearing, our living into, and our taking up of this holy and precious word. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things I would ask him to tell me if he were here. When a 40-year-old insurance salesman named William Parker sat down and wrote those words in 1885, I'm sure... He was thinking all kinds of fond thoughts about all the little children he had taught at the Chelsea Street Baptist Church over the years. He was, by all accounts, a good storyteller. And people who remembered him said that when the Sunday school time was nearing an end and the children in his class started to get restless, Mr. Parker would gather them around and tell them stories, stories of Jesus. And they would fall into silence, hanging on every word. Tell me the stories of Jesus, things I would ask him if he were here. But hey, wait just a minute, Mr. Parker. What do you mean exactly? Things I would ask him if he were here. If he were here, isn't Jesus always here? Isn't Jesus with us to the end of the age? The short answer to that question is yes. Jesus is here. But in order for people to know that, to see that, to to feel that, he needs us to put a little flesh on his body, to put a little muscle into his firm grip on our lives. 
And maybe that's why he's given us these stories in Scripture about shepherds and sheep and lost coins and lamps and table fellowship and and healing stories that we can tell one another as reminders of what Jesus taught us and what we're called to teach one another. That's why I think he often spoke in parables, these little stories containing some sort of faith lesson, though you have to work a little bit. You have to actually think about what he was saying before they make any sense. Stories, you see, are easier to remember than long lists of rules. Stories are easier to work into a conversation. They're easier to carry around with you in your spiritual toolbox, just in case you encounter a situation where some good news is in order. A situation where it is becoming painfully obvious that people need a reminder of of how the kingdom of God is built on such things as mercy and kindness and compassion and unconditional love. For where those things are, the kingdom of God is. Where those things are, Jesus is made visible. Reverend James Moore, who from 1984 to 2006 was the pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Houston, Texas, one of the largest congregations in our denominational family. James Moore wrote that one of the ways that we can discover the central truth of Jesus' Jesus' parables when we encounter one is to look for the surprise in it, to look for that part of Jesus' story that makes us say, oh my goodness, did you hear that? Did you hear that God will search and search and search for even the smallest lost coin? Did you hear that God is the the good shepherd who goes out looking for the lost sheep? Words like that, they have to be comforting to people who have become convinced by the world's blatant way of steering around them that maybe God wants to steer around them too. That maybe God no longer has any patience to deal with their selfishness or their addiction or their years of going astray. Words like that like Dr. James Moore's words about looking for the surprise in a story. Did you hear that God will go looking for the least small thing? That has to be good news to people who've given up on being loved by God. Because you see, the parables of Jesus, they teach that that just the opposite is true. That God is the fretful parent who sits up at night waiting for the sound of our footsteps on the front sidewalk. They teach that God is the faithful friend who sits by our sickbed when everyone else has given up and gone home. Now, if you're still with me, if you're still pondering this stuff about Jesus and and parables and our search for hidden surprises, for the good news hidden inside these strange stories just waiting to be revealed, then maybe you're also thinking, hey, Mr. Preacher, this, that story you just read us from Matthew, that isn't a parable. That's a story about Jesus' encounter with this persistent mother of a tormented daughter. Someone his weary disciples just didn't have the patience to deal with. They urged him, remember, to send her away so they wouldn't have to listen to her shouting. But Jesus has something else in mind. 
He had just, in Matthew's gospel, finished telling the crowd for those who follow according to his way. He'd just been been telling the crowd that for those who follow according to his way, right living is not so much about what goes into your mouth. In this case, he was talking about the complicated dietary laws and the rules about ritual cleanliness. Right living, he said, isn't so much about what goes into your mouth as it is about what comes out. The best way I can explain it is what we eat and when we eat and where we eat and how we eat. Often, all that is a reflection of how much power we hold in this world. The more power we have, the more we get to eat where and when and how and what we want. The more we can be concerned about the details. The more rich and powerful we are, the more we can afford to be concerned about how the table is set and whose names are on the place cards and what kind of flour makes the best biscuits and and which brand of tiny peas taste best in a fancy salad. When we live according to the rules of the world, what and how we eat, it tells an awful lot about who we are. But when we live according to the rules of the kingdom, it's what comes out of our mouth that reveals whose we are. In in this brief exchange with a Canaanite woman who faithful, rule-following people would have immediately dismissed as unclean and annoying, Jesus turns the table and says the unexpected, as if he's rehearsing with her how she's going to tell this story later. I can imagine it, her saying, I just kept pushing my way through the crowd and and shouting so that he could hear me, that he needed to heal my daughter. And his disciples were telling him to send me away. And he turned to me and said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which obviously doesn't include me, but I knew better. I knew he was better than that. And so I got down on my knees and begged him to help me. And he said, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And I just looked up at him and said, now, this is the surprising spot in this story where Jesus has handed his line, he has handed her his line so that she may speak his truth. I can imagine her saying, And I just looked up at him and said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And he took pity on me and he healed my daughter. Can you just see this woman a week or a month or a year later holding the hand of someone who has been convinced by the world Or maybe, according to this story, convinced by those who call themselves Jesus' disciples, but aren't really. Can't you just see this woman a week or a month or a year later holding the hand of someone who has been convinced by the world that whatever pain they're suffering is exactly what they deserve? Can't you just see her holding the hand of someone that most everyone else has decided is unworthy and unclean and saying, hey, let me tell you how it happened for me. And then out of her mouth comes a story of healing and welcome and inclusion and love. You see, Jesus has transformed her into a walking, talking, in the flesh parable of grace. 
He has transformed this woman that the world has already discarded, transformed her so that it is his words spilling out of her mouth. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So here's what I would like for us all to do when we can find a moment. Let's all take some time, each of us, to think about what comes out of our mouth. And I know we're not able to do this much anymore, at least for the moment. I would like for us, though, to think about when we are clumped up together as a family or as a church or as a group of friends to think about what comes out of our collective mouth. And then let's wonder whether what comes spilling out of our mouths helps to build up God's kingdom or whether it threatens to tear it down. Let's all take some time to think about how our life, I don't mean your neighbor's life or my neighbor's life, I mean you, your life, me, my life, we, our life together. Let's think about how our life might just be a parable in the making. Let's think about what hidden nugget of truth is inside. And there is one inside every story, if you look closely enough. Let's think about what the hidden nugget of truth inside the story of your life, of my life, of our life. What does that nugget of truth have to teach future generations, good or bad? Let's all think about that. And then let's pray. Lord, I, I know I don't deserve it, but I also know you are gracious and kind and that there's room for even the likes of me at your table. So how about sending a little healing my way? I want to live in unity with my sisters and my brothers so that together we might sing those psalms of praise. I want to forgive those who've wronged me the way that Joseph in the scriptures managed to forgive. I want to be less concerned about what goes into my mouth, God, and, and more concerned about what goes out. I want, we want to be a blessing to you, God, and to all those you love. And so help us your church, your body. Help us speak your words of healing and forgiveness in everything that we do. And take away from us all self-concern, all fear, all distraction. And make of us, all by ourselves or all of us together, make of us something beautiful and Surprising, God, that only you could create. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
days to come, let's serve God with patience and passion. Let's be deliberate in enacting our faith. Let's be steadfast in celebrating the Spirit's power. And may peace be our way in the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.